did Jesus ride, or did Mary ride on the way to Bethlehem? Oh, I thought, I know that one. Okay. I was afraid he said a test. I thought, oh my God. Uh, what, time, uh, what time, what kind of building was Jesus born in? Oh, I knew that one too. Um, how long after Joseph and Mary arrived in Bethlehem was the child born? How did the star in the night sky differ from all the other stars? There are 10 questions. I had answers for all of them. My classmates, too, I could tell they were feeling pretty good. My teacher collected all the papers, and he said, gentlemen, to tell you this, you all thought you did pretty well. I saw you had answers. Yeah, yeah, feel pretty good, huh? Actually, he said, none of those are answered in the Bible. <laughs> the questions were, according to the Bible, I should have said it, according to the Bible, all those things. There is no donkey. The, the, the star does not have a tail as wide as big as a kite. All of that is part of the poetry and art of Christmas. Nothing wrong with that, except sometimes the poetry and the art can suffocate the baby. We, we forget what Christmas is because we're taken up with these other things. And so doing this lesson, I suspect for some of you was kind of like a slap in the face. Like, you've taken my Christmas away. <laughs> um, perhaps a little bit. But only so that you can understand the true wonder, the true power, and the true mystery. Again, nothing wrong that you know, we three kings of Orient are. And nothing wrong with that. As long as you remember that's part of the additional poetry, not the essential gospel story. Huh? There's nothing contradictory with it. It doesn't conflict with the gospels, but it can, we can get lost. <laughs> People know all those carols. It's like I, whenever I took students uh, when I was in university work on a spring break trip, you know, they could sing the lyrics to every Disney movie. <laughs> the, all the lyrics of every song. They couldn't quote you a poem or a verse from scripture if their life depended on it. And I'm not saying that Disney suffocates the gospels, but it's just something like that can happen that we get so taken up with this, we don't look at that. The first thing to note about the stories of the birth of Jesus is that they are not part of the earliest written strata about Jesus. Again, as we're going to discover this year, the Gospels, as you already have some idea, the Gospels weren't the first parts of the New Testament to be written. The first earliest parts of the New Testament were the letters of Paul. And Paul only mentions once that Jesus was born of a woman. But nothing, there's, no, there's no element of, of Christmas or the Christmas story in the letters of Paul. And as we just, under, just finished with Mark, nor does Mark have anything about the birth of Jesus. It would appear that the gospel tradition happened to think about Jesus' birth in a backward kind of movement. When we, when we read Luke we read the Acts of the Apostles, pay attention to the kerygma, the, the message of, of the preaching. It's about Christ's death and rising. It's all about his death and rising. Not about his miracles, not about his preaching. Paul hardly ever quotes Jesus. It's his death and rising. That's the earliest thing they focus on. Then the more they reflect, so think of Paul's letters, it's death and rising of Jesus. The more they reflect on Jesus, they, they collect stories about he, things that he did and said. Therefore, you get like Mark's gospel, which has, remember, one third of it is the death and rising of Jesus. And then you have this 10 chapters of, of life of Jesus. So Jesus is God, not only in his dying and rising, he is also showing us his divine nature in his ministry. But that was a later thought. Okay? Paul does not emphasize that. He emphasizes the dying and rising. The gospel, Mark, emphasizes the life of Jesus. With Luke and Matthew, we get pushed back further and say, you know what? Jesus isn't divine at Easter, or not just divine at his baptism. He's divine in his infancy, in, in, in his conception. And then we get finally John's gospel, which we'll read later this year. 
John's gospel doesn't begin with Bethlehem. It begins with creation. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. And so as, as we move through the New Testament, Christians start thinking, looking back earlier and earlier and earlier to God's decisive acts. When did God decisively act in Jesus? Traditionally, and if you went to a Catholic school, you were taught, likely, that Luke's gospel is made up of the reports that Mary presented. And that Matthew's gospel is made up of stories that Joseph presented. Now that's nice, because Mary has a, lot, a big role in Luke. Joseph hardly appears. And in Matthew, Mary hardly appears. And Joseph has the major spot. You see where that comes from. But Matthew and Luke tell the same stories rather differently. Matthew has the flight to Egypt. Luke doesn't. Luke has about, talks about the peaceful return to Nazareth. The genealogies, the, the, the family tree, differs in each of those Gospels. So much so that we don't know who Jesus' Jesus's paternal grandfather is. Each gospel gives a different name. Now it's possible one person can have two names. But if you look at the genealogies, there's a lot of differences between the two lists. Now let me sidebar. Again, genealogies in the Bible, in the ancient world, aren't so much about your DNA. They're about who you are. You know? or do you, what kind of people do you come from? So don't get hung up on that. But Based on the genealogies themselves, they're quite different, and, we, and they don't even agree on who Joseph's father was. So we've got differences there. Um, some of the events, you know, Luke has the census, Matthew has the star, Matthew has the massacre. So there's a kind of a, the, the Christmas pageant as you celebrate it as a child. Or when you put your crutch together and you put the shepherds and the wise men together, what you're doing is you're blending these two stories. And that's okay. But you should know that that's not how the Gospels are. Only Matthew has the wise men. Only Luke has the shepherds. Now, I, I don't mean you should like, oh my God, that's terrible. Just saying that we blend them together and we, and we press Blur. And in doing that, we miss what each of the evangelists is trying to tell us through the shepherds or through the wise men. That's my complaint. We blend the story, put it together, and we, we don't read what it means. And that's what we're going to emphasize here. In, en in, any, in any case, both infancy narratives serve as introductions to themes that will echo throughout the evangelist's version of Jesus' public ministry. So, in a sense, the infancy narratives are the whole gospel in miniature. Okay? That's going to be an important... The whole, they're the whole gospel in miniature. Open to Matthew, please. There's a lot of text, so we're not going to be able to give much direction or time to it. I'll just point out some highlights. Man, if all we had was Matthew's Gospel, Christmas would not be what we know as Christmas. It's, it's a very slimmed down narrative. There's actually no story of the birth. There's no angels. There's no little town of Bethlehem. Nothing, nothing, nothing like that. Huh? It's... it's it, the birth happens off scene. It, the gospel begins with, surprise, surprise, a genealogy. What a crazy way to start. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. Son of David, you guys are sharp now. You know that recognizes son of David is what? Messiah, king. Son of Abraham, he is a Jew. Okay. Son of Abraham is a broader... Category, son of David is a more narrow category. Then follows a genealogy from Abraham to Jesus. As you notice, Matthew 
has a thing about numbers. He divides the genealogy into three sets of 14. Now, if I sent you home to trace it in the Old Testament, you would discover that Matthew dropped some of the names out. <laughs> you look at the book of Kings and see who was the father of who was the father of who. He, he cut some of them out. Why? Because he's fixated on 14. Not, you say, that's not fair. Okay, that's only a problem if you're expecting genealogies to be about DNA. They're not. They're a statement about who this character is. Hebrew and Greek uh, letters, and Latin for that too, Roman numerals, Latin, num Roman letters also are numbers, Roman numerals. Huh? So with Greek and Hebrew. Um, the name David is spelled DVD. Direct video disc. That's David in Hebrew. Remember, there's no vowels. Okay? And each of those letters has a numerical value. Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Daleth. Four. Four. And Wa is six. Four plus six plus four is fourteen. It's a little numerical game that Matthew structures the genealogies around 14 to emphasize Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the long awaited for offspring of David. The three sets of 14 homiletically have something to say. The first 14 are the patriarchs. You recognize some of those names, don't you? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, you, you, these aren't all saints, are they? Huh? Remember Jacob in particular? Ra, and then so, so it's a wild, crazy bunch. The patriarchs. Jesus is, is one of the offspring of the patriarchal story. And the patriarchs are sometimes faithful men, and they're sometimes shysters. Okay? Then the next 14 are all kings. <coughs> From verse 6 second half to verse 11. Now, there, there are more than 14 kings in the family tree uh, of, of David, but he, he cuts them to 14. The monarchy, how did the monarchy turn out in the end? It's an institution, and was it? It was wonderful in some ways, but in some ways it was awful. Like all institutions, government, business, church, it's flawed. The Jesus has in his bloodstream not just the patriarchs, but royal blood. But it's a royal line that's flawed. The last 14 from verse 12 to the end are nobodies. We don't know anything except about except Shealtiel and Zerubbabel appear, and the rest are nobodies until you get to Joseph. Jesus also has in his blood. Nobody, people of no account. I don't know if Matthew meant all of that, but it's an interesting kind of thing. The patriarchs, kings, nobodies. And there are women. Women did not usually figure in a genealogy in Judaism. But these women have a past. You remember Tamar? What's Tamar's story? What did she do? She, Jacob. She, she, tricked she tricked Jacob. Jacob was, was to marry his sons to her, and two of them died, and he would not give the third son because he's afraid that she would, he would die. So she dresses up as a hooker during the harvest days on the, at, the, at the Christmas at the church picnic, no, at the crossroads, and sleeps with him and has a child, and that's the child in the twins in the genealogy. Yes, thank you. Judah, not Jacob. Excellent. Rahab. Rahab. Who's she? She's a prostitute in Jericho. She assisted the Israelite spies. And she's a foreigner. She become, And so is Tamar, a foreigner. She's a Canaanite. Huh? And then there's Ruth. We haven't read Ruth yet. She is a foreigner too. 
from Moab. She's a Moabite. And there's a kind of a sketchy thing about sexuality in Ruth, too. We're not sure what to make of it, but there's a, cl a cloud over the story. And then there's the wife of Uriah, better known as Bathsheba. Bathsheba. Remember Bathsheba? Yeah. Mrs. King David, the second, yeah. So all, so all of these, why does Matthew go out of his way? He doesn't have to mention any women. Why does he go out of his way to mention these four? It's, it's a little bit of a puzzle. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's the, the, the foreign content is, is a matter. These are foreigners. Uriah was a Hittite. So the assumption Matthew's making is that Bathsheba was a Hittite, was a foreigner. We're going to see in, remember how Jesus deals with, 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 um, with uh, non-Jews in Mark's gospel, in Gentile, with Gentiles. Here in Jesus' family tree, there is Gentile blood. At the end of the gospel of Matthew, Jesus will famously say, go to all nations, baptize them. It's the clearest demonstration that Jesus had a vision for a universal ministry. That's at the end of the gospel. And, and so it's no surprise at the beginning, uh, foreigners, Gentiles, have a place in Jesus' genealogy. And of course then there's this something kind of sketchy, iffy about the conception of their children. I mean, the, the sexual thing is a little... Which corresponds to Mary, because there's something unusual. She bears a child without a male participation. Okay? That's... that Raymond Brown is the great Catholic scholar on this, and those are his, his suggestions. The Gentile connection, and that God will use amazing things uh, and, 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 and unusual sexual themes in, in getting things to where he wants them to be. 18 to, to, to the end of the chapter is the Annunciation to Joseph. Think about the pictures of the Annunciation you know. You know, here's the angel Gabriel, and then here's Mary, you know, knitting or with a book in her lap, and she's all very pious and prayerful. That's not Matthew's version of the Annunciation. Matthew's version is Joseph bolted up in bed in the middle of the night, sweat coming down his, because he had a dream that he's supposed to marry, that his girlfriend is pregnant, and he's not the father, and he should marry her anyway. <laughs> That's the annunciation to Joseph. In a dream. Joseph, dream. Any lights go off for you? Okay. In the nativity story in Matthew, dreaming is a sub-theme. The couple goes to Egypt because a dream, an angel in a dream, and the angel tells them when Herod is dead, they can come back. And the angel says, don't go to Bethlehem, go to Nazareth. So just as Joseph in Genesis is given dreams, so Joseph in the New Testament gospel parallels that. In this dream, there is a quotation of scripture, or actually after it. Let's read verse 20 when the angel speaks. Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. Okay? So the child can be born of the Holy Spirit, and this child will be a savior. And then Matthew, the narrator, continues. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. The prophet in question is Isaiah, chapter 7. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. And then, again, the narrator steps in to say, which means God with us. Okay. If you, I want another whole piece of homework. I want you tonight uh, to read, look up Isaiah 7 and see what you find there. And depending on the Bible translation you have, you will not find what Matthew presents here. 
This is a big shock to some people. Okay? Um, the Hebrew of Isaiah 7 714 literally read literally read behold an alma alma will conceive alma means young woman now in the ancient world the the assumption was a young girl would be protected by her parents by her father in particular would not have had sexual relations so the assumption is a young girl will be a virgin but the word does not mean virgin it means young girl. But you see here, the word is distinctly virgin. In your Old Testament, Isaiah 7, it, whatever, whatever, the, whatever the translator uses, it, it's young girl. But, hold on, hold your hats. But, you're, I think you remember, maybe not, maybe I haven't talked about it. The Hebrew Bible couldn't be read by Jews who had forgotten their language. I am German in, in background, ethnicity. The only German I know is stuff I picked up from Hogan's Heroes. Okay, Raus and Dunkoff and you know, I know nothing, none of stuff like that, okay. Um, so it's natural that Peoples, when they live in a foreign land, they lose their native tongue. Jews living abroad, most of them quite quickly lost their native tongue. Most Jews living in the outside Israel in the late Old Testament after the exile spoke Greek. Alexander the Great, remember, comes through and conquers all and he, he spreads Hellenism, Greek ideas. So most, the, the, the the universal language in the Eastern Roman Empire, even before Roman Empire, was Greek. So a couple centuries before Jesus, Jews living in Egypt are translating their sacred writings into Greek so that their children can read them. That collection is called the Septuagint. Have you ever heard that word before? You have, okay, good. I'm not sure if I had mentioned that before. In the Septuagint. Now, the Septuagint was translated before Jesus. And it was seen by Jews, even by, he, by, by Greek-speaking Jews, as sacred. That's a halo, okay? It was understood by Greek-speaking Jews as being protected by God, that God watched over and, and made sure that the translation was a fit one. And in the Septuagint, before Jesus, when the nameless translator renders Isaiah, he writes Parthenos. Like the Parthenon in Athens, the Parthenon is dedicated to the goddess Athena, who is a virgin. Parthenon is, a, is dedicated to the virgin goddess. Athena. So this, and again, Matthew is writing in Greek. So this is a long road. I just, I want to give you the story because if you have Protestant friends who like to pick on you, you know, pick on you because you're Catholic or pick on you because they don't understand our devotion to Mary. They'll say, well, the Bible doesn't say virgin. It says, you know, Isaiah says, young woman. Well, there's the whole story. There's an extra step. Yes, indeed. Isaiah says young woman, who generally would have been a virgin, but not necessarily. But then there's the translation into Greek done a century or two before Jesus, respected by Jews, by, by, for, by, out, by, by diaspora Jews as sacred, and there the, the translator used the word Parthenos. And that's what Matthew is picking up here. That Jesus is, and it wasn't that they read the Septuagint and then said, well, then Mary must have been a virgin. No, the experience of Jesus' birth got them looking for things, and then they find this and go, OMG. All right? You follow that? I hope it was just, wasn't just an adventure in the woods, but you, you might meet people who get hung up on these things, or you might read a commentator or know it all, and, uh, and that's the fuller story. 
That quotation, line 23, is what's called a formula citation. Matthew has about a dozen of them. He reaches back to the Old Testament and says, this was done to complete or fulfill what the prophet so-and-so said. Okay? Matthew is the most Jewish of the evangelists, and he has five of them, I think, five of these quotations just in his infancy narrative. He wants to make the point. Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophet's longing. Chapter 2 begins with the story of the wise men. They're not kings. There's not three of them, though they bring three gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But the key thing about them is they are foreigners. They are Gentiles. They follow the, a star, a thing in nature. But when they get to Jerusalem, they, the star disappears. It only brought them so far. So they had to stop. If it's a king they're looking for, they stop at the palace. And the palace king, Herod, doesn't know anything. I mean, he's in charge. He doesn't want any new kings coming along. He's the king. And so... He, when they ask about where is the newborn king, he knows he doesn't have any new, newborn children, but the, he calls in the chief, the priests, who bring the scriptures in, and they quote the prophet Micah in verse 5. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, <coughs> for so it is written, you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, no means least among the rulers of Judah, from you shall come a ruler who shall govern my people Israel. Now, that's not a formula citation completely, but it's halfway there. Herod wants to find out where the child is to kill it, so he asks the wise men to travel and then come back. Notice, Herod doesn't go. The priests don't go. Again, if you've ever been to Israel, you know Bethlehem is not very far away. It's about five miles. You could do it in an hour and a half, two hours at most. Nobody moves except the furners. Okay? And, and that is a theme that will be linked in Matthew's gospel. That those who should know better, first the chief priests and the elders, those who should know better about what God wants, are the last to understand that Gentiles from far away get it, but Herod and the chief priests don't. That's how this text is linked to the gospel. The gospel will repeat that theme over and over again. I'm not going to read the rest of chapter 2. I'll just briefly remind you about its parts this is Herod's desire to destroy the child. He sends soldiers to Bethlehem to slay the children under two years of age, which should make you think of what other king? Huh? Moses? Let me, let me, what other king? Pharaoh, huh? Pharaoh? Remember Pharaoh? Remember? Remember? Were you here last year? <laughs> you, you know, you, my, Moses, you were in the right church with the wrong pew, okay? The, the, the point is, Matthew is consciously saying Jesus recapitulates the story of his people. Like Moses was rescued out of Egypt, Jesus was rescued by being taken to Egypt. As there was a king trying to destroy the Israelites, Pharaoh, so there is an evil king in Jesus' life wanting to destroy. As Joseph in the Old Testament was guided by dreams, so Joseph of the New Testament is guided by dreams. As the Israelites cross through the desert and then actually cross first the no through the Red Sea and then through the desert. Jesus later will spend 40 days in the desert and be baptized in the River Jordan. 
So you see, there's a lot of echoes. Jesus is recapitulating the saving work of the Old Testament. That's really all I want to say, though there are a handful of these formula citations where Matthew reaches back to the Old Testament. We can't even for sure find one of the references. He says, he quotes, he shall be a Nazarene, and there's nothing really like that. Nazir, remember Nazir, Nazir, like Sal, um, Nazarite. Nazarite, thank you. A Nazarite, uh, like the judge Samson. Huh? So that's the closest they can find. There's, so, but Matthew's point is, Jesus is a fulfillment of the promises of old. So, that's, that, that's the Christmas story, according to Matthew. See how slim it is? Genealogy, Annunciation to Joseph, wise men. Escape to Egypt. Questions? Luke's Gospel. Didn't give you much time, then, did I? <laughs> Luke, where, where Matthew is slim, Luke is long. While all the Gospels begin with John the Baptist, Luke makes John's connectedness to the Gospel story more profound by presenting John and Jesus as cousins. We got into this last time about surely John knew Jesus at his baptism in Mark. Not in Mark's gospel, we don't know that. It's only in Luke where there are relatives. Okay? And Luke makes much of it. What, will, what happens in Luke's infancy story is that there's what we call step. There's, there's a parallelism between John and Jesus, but that Jesus is always one step better than John. Okay? So there'll be a similarity. So John is born to an elderly couple way beyond their years, announced by an angel. Okay? John the Baptist to Zechariah and Anna. But what is Jesus? Jesus is born to a virgin. Okay? That kind of trumps just the old couple thing, huh? John is born from normal human sexuality, though a couple beyond the age that they should have children, kind of like Abraham and Sarah. Jesus is one better in being born of the Holy Spirit and not a human father. Okay? That's, that's one characteristic of Luke. The second characteristic is this. Characters are wont to express themselves in poetry. I don't, I'm not a big fan of Broadway, uh, but you know, the, the characters on stage will talk, and then all of a sudden someone will sing. Okay? You know, Rogers and Hammerstein? Well, Luke is like Rogers and Hammerstein. There's a series of poetic I say it's songs, it, it doesn't say Mary sang, but poetry was sung in that culture. So it is a little bit like that kind of a play, where there's a dialogue, and then somebody sings to reveal their feelings or their emotions or their fears. Opera can be like that too. Dialogue, and then somebody sings an aria, explaining. Well, they got it from Luke, okay? Luke has this as well. So, step parallelism, and then interruptions for poetic song. Chapter 1. Uh, we already read verses 1 through 4 when we read the historical document on the historical truth of the Gospels, where Luke describes the process by which he composed his Gospel. But verse 5 begins the announcement of the birth of the Baptist. Zechariah, the priest, it's his lucky day. There were hundreds and hundreds of priests, and the jobs were taken by flipping the coin. And the top job was to go in and offer incense 
in the Holy of Holies. You remember how the temple is built, huh? There's the outside curtain, and then there's in there, there's the altar of showbread, and then there's a candelabra, and then there's the curtain over the Holy of Holies. So every day, one priest gets to go in there and incense where the Ark of the Covenant used to be. Some priests lived their whole lives and never got to do that. This is Zachariah's day. He's in there doing it, and lo and behold, there's an angel. <laughs> and the angel says, yo, bro, God has heard your prayers. So he's been praying, evidently, about offspring. God has heard your prayers, and you are going to have a child. Okay, look at verse 13. The angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer is heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. You shall call his name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. But Zechariah doesn't seem to believe it, which is kind of ironic. Except remember, it's those people who normally should be most prepared to receive the good news of the gospel who don't receive it. It's very easy for clergy. I mean, I know you are scandalized. The people of God, you are scandalized by clergy behaving badly. The news has always got it. Huh? Well, when you live in church, when you sleep in church, it all becomes kind of ho-hum. For you, it's sacred and special. For clergy, it can, we get sloppy, we get lazy, it becomes ho-hum, and that's how we get to be scandals. Well, I can say your marriage is the same way, huh? <laughs> I mean, when you were dating, oh my God, I can, I can, all I can do is think about her. And now, days, weeks go by, and you don't think of her in that same way. Huh? So there, touche. Um, <laughs> Zechariah is made mute by the angel kind of as a punishment but also kind of as a retreat you go on retreat shut your mouth you, you've been telling other people about what God does and you yourself aren't ready to receive the news that God is active okay that's Annunciation 1 Annunciation 2 is the one you know so well huh the same angel, Gabriel, comes to a young woman of Nazareth. And this reveals a pattern that you guys remember from Moses or from uh, Gideon. So there's a pattern when God calls somebody. There's, there is the, the angel who says something. The person says, woe is me, not me. <laughs> And so the angel says, peace be with you. And then says, God wants to, your help to save the world. And what do Moses and Gideon do? They say, oh, we can't do that. I mean, Moses says, I, I can't speak. Remember all the excuses Moses comes up with? Gideon says, how am I? I am the, I'm the youngest son of the weakest tribe. Okay. Well, God picks people who are nobodies. Because the work's going to be God's work, not your work. So there is, after the announcement that God wants your help, the person being asked declines or says they can't, explains why. The angel explains, here's what God's going to do to help you. And then the, the Moses or Gideon or Mary say, famously, let it be done to me according to your word. That's a pattern for a biblical call. God still calls that way. When God comes to you, your first reaction is, oh, that's nothing, I don't know. And when God says, I want your help, what do you say? Well, I got this, and I got this to do, and I got that to do. I can't do that. I'm not a clergyman. And then God says, don't worry. I'll give you what you need. And then God's waiting. He's waiting for your okay. So don't think that this happens just to the Marys and Zacharias and the deacons and the priests. I am very confident God has tried to hook you more than once. You wouldn't be here if God hadn't dragged you here. So be ready 
for your answer. And don't be surprised that you're afraid. If you're not afraid, then I'm afraid. If you, if you think God's, you're God's gift and you're going to fix the world, I'm very scared of you. <laughs> the, the appropriate response is, God, I can't do this. Well, that's the right response. Anyway, Mary is exactly that. She is the, she, her annunciation is perfectly that. And then she breaks into song. The handout I gave you this morning, the one side had the stuff about, um, about the 13th chapter of Mark. Flip it over, and what you'll see is very crudely done, but on the left is what Mary, I'm sorry, I'm ahead of myself here. Mary, so we had Zachariah's Annunciation, we have Mary's Annunciation, Mary leaves Nazareth to go to visit her relative. Why? Your teacher has taught you because Mary wanted to help her cousin. No, 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 no. If that was the case, then why did she bug out before the child was born? She leaves before John is born. Okay. That's when the work begins. You know, diapers, huh? Okay. Mary, the angel said, now Zechariah, when he doesn't believe, he gets muted. When Mary says, how can this be? The angel gives her an explanation. God is, can do anything. All things are possible for God. In fact, right now, your very elderly old lady relative, Anna, is six months pregnant. And so when the angel leaves, Mary takes off because she wants to know that it's true. She wants to make sure she didn't just imagine all of this. So when she enters, when she makes the travel, the 80, 90, 100 miles to around Jerusalem, and she enters into the household of Elizabeth, it says, verse 41, when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the babe in her womb leapt, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed, blessed are you among women, blessed is the fruit of your womb, which is familiar to you, I hope, as being the part of the Hail Mary, huh? Why is this granted me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Elizabeth is in on the story. She knows what's going on, that God is working through them. And verse 44, For behold, when the voice of your greeting came to my ears, the babe in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Then Mary, it says, it just says, but it's poetry. So it's a song. It's meant to be sung. This is, this is the canticle of Mary, it's called. It, it's by its Latin first word, magnificat. Magnify, make great. All right? On the left-hand side, the lower right hand, left hand corner is the text of the Magnificat. On the right hand side is a song that an earlier character in the Old Testament spoke when her child was born. Hannah. Remember Hannah? Hannah was the mother of Samuel. Okay? And you're going to find there's, there's similarities. Hannah says, my heart exalts in Yahweh. Mary says, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. Back to the Hannah side, the fourth line, I rejoice in your power of saving. Back to the Magnificat, my spirit exalts in God, my Savior. Uh, back to the Hannah side, there is none as holy as Yahweh. On the Mary side, holy is his name. Back to the Hannah side, there's these, these series of reversals. The bow of the mighty is broken, but the feeble have girded themselves with strength. The sated hired themselves out for bread. The famished ceased from labor. The barren woman bears sevenfold. The mother of many is desolate. What's going on there is Hannah is celebrating that God has stepped into her life and turned things upside down in a good way. Mary, something very similar, right? Uh, Left-hand side, uh, he has shown the power of his arm. He has routed the proud of heart. He has pulled down princes from their thrones and exalted the lowly. 
The hungry he has filled with good things, the rich sent away empty. He has come to the help of Israel, his servant, mindful of his mercy. So the Magnificat, Mary's song of praise, is a New Testament echo of Hannah's song. A curious thing about the Magnificat is some of the verbs are in the past tense. The mighty has done great things for me. He has shown the power of his arm. He has routed the proud of heart. Now, the gospel is just starting. Nothing has happened. But Mary is so convinced that God is as good as his word that she sings it in the past tense. Like it's already happened. Prophets in the Old Testament do that too. So sure are they that God is going to do what he's pledged. They sing about it in the past tense. It's already happened. It's sure, it's as sure as happened already. All right? So Mary and Hannah stand for a whole cohort of women who are God's instruments, who sing God's praise in the world turned upside down. God is stepping in to turn things upside down. The Magnificat is Mary's interpretation, her sung interpretation of what God is doing in her and through her for us all. Then the John is born, okay? Um, and then, there's a, then Zachariah's got a canticle about John the Baptist. Though if you notice, at some point, it sounds like he stops talking about John and starts talking about Jesus. Um, um, verse 76. You, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. You will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. So Zechariah is given his voice back, and he sings this poem that celebrates John as the one who's really preparing for the Lord, the Most High. Okay? So let me pan the camera back a little bit. We're, we're almost to Christmas, so I know you're hanging on for that. But I want to point out again some of the language that definitely shows that while John the Baptist is something special, Jesus is something special squared, cubed. Okay? Uh, chapter 1, verse 76. Again, you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High. You will become the prophet of the Most High. Look to chapter 1, verse 32. Okay, um, Jesus the, will be great, will be called the Son of the Most High. Okay, so while John is the prophet of the Most High, Jesus is the Son of the Most High. Um, 1, 16 and 17, where John will turn many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. 143. Jesus is the Lord himself. Why should the Lord come to me? Okay, so John is the precursor. Jesus is the real deal. That gets us to chapter 2. This is the story that we know very well. It has a very formal introduction. Luke places it so we know what's happening in history. That Caesar Augustus is ruling, that the governor is Quirinius, and that during all that time, according to David's lineage, this child who was born to Mary, verse 7, she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes laid him in a manger, a manger. Uh, manger in French is to eat. A manger is a receptacle for animals to eat. This is where the idea of the child being born in a stable, okay? Because there's a trough for animals to eat. But if you again, if you go to Israel, they don't have trees. <laughs> they don't have many trees at all. And so animals are kept in caves or in fences made of rocks. 
So if you, you know, Europeans have trees and we put animals in barns. And so that's where the wooden stable stuff comes from. Where it's very likely it would be in a cave, and maybe their house is, a, is above the cave. The cave's kind of a, they, they built around a wall and made it kind of a basement stable. But that's where Joseph and the family are, that's the manger is, so maybe likely that's where uh, Luke envisions the, the family gathering. Now, then comes the angels going to shepherds. Now, we know King David was a shepherd, and we so thought that's pretty cool, huh? But shepherds, if you think about it, what's a nasty job? Nasty job, because you don't work 40 hours, do you? Again, they don't keep their sheep in pens. They don't have fencing. They, they maybe have a, a circle of rocks they put them in at night so that the wolves don't take them. They don't wander off, but they don't have fencing. And, uh, sheep and goats are, the good land is for crops. And then there's the desert, and in between, there's land that doesn't get a lot of water, but it gets enough water to give you some grasses. That's where the sheep and goats are raised, okay? So it's not their land, it's just, it's just land that the animal flocks go up and down. So to be a shepherd was to be on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It was assumed that shepherds were thieves, that shepherds couldn't take care of their family, because, I mean, you know, who knows who your wife is sleeping with? Who knows what your daughters are doing? Because you're out in the wilds, huh? You don't go home every day. You spend weeks and weeks out on the frontier, and then you come home. Nobody wants... So shepherds are a lot, would be a little bit like we have people who come through who work seasonally in an area. Migrants. That would be a, a sociological connection. But it's not to Caesar Augustus. It's not to, to the governor Quirinius. It's not to any of the big wigs that the announcement is made. It's to shepherds. That's the importance of the shepherds. Okay? They, they stand for a marginal group of people who hear about God's great thing. And then there's the angel's song. Another one of the songs. We've had a song from Mary, a song from Zechariah. The angels have a little song. And then the shepherds go off and tell other people. And Mary contemplates all these things and what they mean. Okay, verse 19. Mary kept all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God. But again, they never appear, do they? <laughs> Same with the wise men. They kind of cavort off the pages of the Bible, and they never appear again. It's kind of funny. The, gospel, the, the infancy narratives, there's no real connections between the infancy narratives. Characters in the infancy narratives do not reappear in the Gospels. Like they're separate stories that have been joined in some fashion. Then, I want again, I'm, I'm going to move fast here. Uh, when the child is old enough, they bring the child to the temple, okay, to present. Look at, look at verse 22. The time came for their purification. Their purification. Tell me, class, who needs purification? Mary. Mary. Luke is not a Jew, okay? Luke is, he's kind of out there. He's, 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 he knows a little bit about it, but doesn't know it all firsthand. So he makes some mistakes here. They brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Really what they're doing is two different things. Mary, because of the issuance of the child in blood, she's got to go to the temple and make a sacrifice to be purified again. And the child needs to, because it's a boy, needs to be bought back. Remember, back to Exodus, as Moses is getting the people ready to leave Egypt, he says, the firstborn, I'm going to take the firstborn of Egypt. Your firstborn are owed to me. You must buy them back. 
and an animal, you must break its neck, the firstborn. Because that's how I get my firstborn. So there's two things going on when the couple brings the child to the temple, right? And again, it's one of your questions. They offer a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons, which was the poverty clause for doing this. If you could afford it, it was a lamb you were supposed to offer. So that Mary and Joseph used two pigeons reflects their poverty. By the way, poverty and the danger of wealth is going to be a huge issue in Luke's gospel. The fact that Mary and Joseph come to the temple shows that they are righteous, religious people. Huh? They're observing the law. And that's where Simeon pops up, who is like a prophet of the Old Testament. And Simeon gets a song as well. He sings, verse 29, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word. Your eyes have seen your, my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles, the glory for your people Israel. This child is a light to the Jews and the Gentiles. I told you earlier, Luke is a Gentile. He's going to show Jesus having a real ministry and outreach to Gentiles. Okay? This little poem of Simeon's is filled with references, selections from the prophet Isaiah. It's really made up of a lot of little statements like that. Okay? Then, Simeon acknowledges to Mary that this child is, in verse 34, is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is spoken against. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that thoughts out of many hearts will be revealed. So, a hint of the cross. This child is going to suffer, but this child will come into our lives and demand that we make a choice. For or against. Okay? 39. When they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew, notice there's no escape to Egypt. There's no threatening, of, threatening by Herod in Luke's gospel. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Then there's the one incident left of the child at age 12. Who says the thing that every parent hates to hear? Jesus, when they, when they find Jesus and they say, did you not know that we were worried? Jesus says, you don't own me. Do you not know? I must be busy about my Father's will. Most of us, I think, again from preaching, have the idea that, or we're told that Jesus is quizzing, is like showing his smarts. Actually, the text really means Jesus is learning and asking questions to learn. He's growing. Jesus is growing in knowledge, which will lead to his ministry, will lead to his mission. Okay? As with Matthew, the infancy narrative of Luke introduces themes that will be important later in the gospel. The continuity of this Jesus thing with Judaism. Okay? The content Matthew did the same. There's a link. Yes, Jesus is something new, but there's a continuity with God's plan of all. The genealogy in Matthew does it, and all these references, you know, back to the Old Testament in Matthew, and, and here the, the connection to the temple. Okay? God's favor for the poor and the oppressed. And the centrality of the temple as a backdrop and a locale are all things that will continue in Luke's gospel. 